Test. Test, test, test. Test, test. Test, test. Test, test, test. Actually, is this on? Test. Test, test. Test, test. Test, test. There it is. It's on. Thank you. This is kind of quiet. meeting in Topeka today. We've got uh, all the, well, majority of the camp is gone, and uh, they're usually the loud ones, so uh, it may, you may notice it's, uh, it's smaller just because it's not quite as loud, but uh, anyway, we're here to worship God, and uh, it doesn't matter the size, 
If we're here to do the same thing, it's going to be powerful, and God's going to be glorified. So let's continue singing together. His love endures forever. Thanks to the Lord for He is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord and Lord. His love endures forever. To Him who among us does great wonders. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of God. His love endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for His love endures forever. Sing praise to His name for His promises are good. Give thanks to the Lord for His love endures forever. Sing praise to His name. His love reigns forever. Him who calls us from our sorrow, His love endures forever. Lead us from our enemies, His love endures forever. By His wisdom made the heavens, His love endures forever. Spread the earth upon the sea. His love endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for His love endures forever. Sing praise to His name for His promises are good. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for His love endures forever. Sing praise to His name. His love reigns forever. To him who calls us his disciple, his love endures forever. He sent his son to die on the tree, his love endures forever. Him who came down to call us higher, his love endures forever. And by his truth, us free. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord for His love endures forever. Sing praise to His name for His promises are good. Give thanks to the Lord for His love endures forever. Sing praise to His name. His love reigns forevermore. Amen. You know, uh, hey, this uh, this weather I know has been kind of a, a tease. So it got warmer early, uh, late in the week here, but then it's cooled way back down again. Uh, the leaves are starting to change. I think even the, the trees and the bushes are a little confused. Uh, I know at least in my house that they start dropping the leaves and then they stop and then they start dropping a few more. So I think uh, every everything in nature is waiting for something to commit here with the season. But the nice thing about the change of seasons is I always feel like it's just a way to see God and how God's moving uh, and how he changes things from one way to another. And as we come in this morning, uh, hopefully everyone has that mindset and that heart to be able to be changed this morning by what's said, what's shared through God's scripture, through the songs that we sing here together, uh, that we can bond closer together as family, but then we can also uh, draw closer as family to God as he leads us. Amen? Amen. Let's continue singing together if you want to love him. If you want to love him, if you want to love him, then you got to live like him. If you want to love him, if I'm going to follow him, if I'm going to follow him, then I need to leave my sin. If I'm going to follow him, if I'm going to serve him, if I'm gonna serve him, then I need to share about him. If I'm gonna serve him, don't you hear him calling? Don't you hear him calling? He 
I invite you all to stand with me as we continue singing. Well, thank you, Lord, for loving me, and thank you, Lord, for blessing me. 
Thank you, Lord, for making me whole and saving my soul. I want to thank you, Lord, for loving me. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Let us all with one chord sing praises to Christ the Lord. Let us all unite in song and praise Him all day long. I want to thank you, Lord, for loving me. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. And please reveal your will for me so I can serve you for eternity. Use my life in every way. Take all the things today. I want to thank you, Lord, for loving me. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. I want to thank you, Lord, for loving me. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Amen. Amen. We'll continue singing here uh, as we prepare for communion. Sing hallelujah to the Lord. This is a cappella. Men will start off. Women will uh, then. Well, it's really of an echo, but uh, there's a second part. Uh, you know what to do. <laughs> it really does not. You know, this, this uh, leading the music has been great. I've learned so much, but I am not musically educated. So I really just stand up here and tell, uh, do what they tell me to do. So it looks like maybe I've got some role in leading, but they actually really kind of do the leading, and I just uh, play the part here. So we're going to sing together. You guys actually make everything sound great. So uh, as we sing this, just really be thinking about the cross. Uh, Jesus' sacrifice as he hung there for us, died, gave his life uh, so that we could be purified uh, through the righteousness, that, uh, the life that he lived here, the relationship he had with his father, and uh, what he was doing was trying to bring us back to uh, the cross so that we could connect with God in our relationships with um, the father here on earth. So let's keep that in mind as we sing this song together. Sing hallelujah to the Lord. Sing hallelujah to the Lord. Sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah to the Lord. Jesus is risen from the dead. Jesus is risen from the dead. Jesus is risen. Jesus is risen. Jesus is risen from the dead. Jesus is living in his church. Jesus is living in his church. Jesus is living. Jesus is living. Jesus is living in his church. Jesus is Lord of heaven and earth. Jesus is Lord of heaven and earth. Jesus is Lord of heaven and earth. Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord of heaven and earth. Jesus is Lord of back to claim his own. He's coming back to claim his own. He's coming back. He's coming back. He's coming back to claim his own. So sing hallelujah to the Lord. Sing hallelujah to the Lord. Sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah to the Lord. You may be seated. Good morning, church. Good morning. This is our time in our service where we focus our hearts and our minds on the cross. And uh, much like Jay, 
Uh, what I'm going to share with you this morning is not profound. Um, it's a very familiar passage of scripture, uh, but I think it does speak for itself as well. Uh, if you'll please turn your Bibles over to John 3.16. <clears throat> John 3, verse 16, the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. You know, the Bible says here that God did not send his Son into the world to condemn us. And yet, this world is full of condemnation. And some of us, we walk around and we carry a lot of burdens on us. And we walk around feeling condemned. And God says that that's not why he sent Jesus here for us. That he did not send Jesus into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. And as disciples, we don't have to walk around condemned. Because Jesus says here, whoever believes in him is not condemned. Now, if you believe in Jesus this morning, and you're walking around and you're feeling condemned, this is a great time this morning to really reflect on the cross and understand really what did Jesus do for you. And the fact that regardless of what you're going through, regardless of what is happening, that you don't have to stand or feel condemned. Because your Lord and Savior has already paid the price, no matter what it is. He says, whoever believes in him is not condemned and shall not perish, but have eternal life. You know, one day we're all going to leave here. And Jesus said, the promise is that when you leave here, it's not going to get worse. It's going to get better. It's going to get better because we get a chance to spend eternity in heaven with our Father. Amen? Amen. So at this time this morning, let's celebrate. Let's celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. Amen? Let's celebrate forgiveness of sin. And let's celebrate the promise of eternal life. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are an awesome God. And you are worthy of all praise. And God, no matter what we're going through, no matter what we may, what burdens we may be carrying, Father, we're thankful that you have already paid the price for us. God, that you have already sent Jesus to die on the cross for our sin so that we could be forgiven and so that we can have eternal life. We're so grateful, Father, that you've loved us so much and that you have given your very, very best for us. I pray, God, that our hearts are humbled this morning, that our hearts are really surrendered to love you and be faithful to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Go ahead, and we'll stand together as we sing before the message. We'll praise you. seated. Amen. Amen. Good morning, church. Good morning. All right, before I'm moving to the sermon, I have an announcement to make. So we have a few couples from EuroAsia who are going to be in Lawrence tonight from 6.30 to 8, and we're going to meet them at Long's house. I know that there's going to be hot apple cider. And maybe some other things as well. I think the Anderson are bringing something else as well. Uh, and I don't know what your motivation is in this kind of cases, whether you want to come to encourage them. I know that personally for me the motivation is I want to come and be encouraged and be inspired by what is happening in EuroAsia because God is working around the world. And uh, sometimes we forget <laughs> about that. So, amen. Uh, Ken, please be there at 630 to eight. All right, so the message for today, I have two main points. The first one is that life comes in fragments, and the second one is that we cannot choose what happens to us, but we can choose our response. All right. uh, we have, I have some slides. So I can see that a lot of people, you look at this and you're thinking, I'm alone. Next slide. All right, some of People know as the Godfather. All right. Good. Next one. Terminator. Yes. He'll be back. Uh, and I don't know, but when I was growing up, I mean, we had this connecting the dots things. You go around by the numbers, and then, well, in some cases, it's very easy to know what it is. All right, let's check the next slide. It's just a dot. Now you're thinking like, okay, when I connect the dots, what is it going to be? Now, it's very difficult to tell what it's going to be when you haven't seen the movie, when you don't have all the dots, you have to wait for all the dots, and then you can go back and connect them and see what the picture is. 
Now, the thing with our live is that we don't see all the dots at the same time. As live happens, we're getting a dot. We're getting a fragment of what the picture is. And then eventually, at some time in the future, we're able to make those connections. If we still remember all the dots, whatever happened in our lives, sometimes we can just forget about it. So the first point is that our life happens in fragments. And I read this story, it's a Chinese story, uh, and I'm going to share with you the Christian version of the story, which is about this old man who had a white horse. And this horse was so beautiful, so majestic, that everybody wanted this horse. And everybody was offering him money to buy this horse from him. Even the king was jealous of his horse and was offering him every time more money to get the horse. But the old man said, this horse is very precious to me. It's not just a horse. It's not a possession. It's a friend. How can someone sell his friend? Everybody in the village was telling him, sell the horse. You've got to turn your life around. You're going to get away from poverty. Get the money. Sell the horse. But the old man was, no. It's my friend. I could never sell the horse. And then one morning he wakes up and the horse is gone. And everybody in the village is, well, you foolish old man. You should have sold the horse. At least now you would have had some money. Somebody probably stole your horse because... The horse was famous all over, all over the part of the world. And now you're left with nothing. But the old man said, well, all we know right now is that the horse is gone. Anything beyond that is just speculation. Because that's the only fragment in time that we see. God knows what's going on. Well, the people didn't believe him. They said, well, you're just trying to make yourself feel good. You're trying to make yourself feel good. The reality is that your horse is gone and you're poor. And you made a foolish decision. You should have sold the horse. And this is a cursing because you were arrogant and didn't take the advice. Well, what happens is two weeks later, the horse shows up. And now there's 12 wild horses along with the horse. The people in the village come to the old man and say, like, well, old man, you were right. Actually, it wasn't a curse. It was a blessing. You had one. Now you have 13. You're going to make so much money out of this. And the old man said again, well, we don't know. All we know right now is that my horse is back and I have 12 more. That's all we can see right now and that's all we can say. Well, the old man had only one son and his son started to break the horses and train them. And his, as he's doing that, he, he falls and breaks his leg. Now when his son breaks the leg, there's nobody else in the house to do all the chores and, and helping the old man or... Uh, train the horses or anything like that. So the people, well, yeah, you were right. Actually, that was a curse. See, now your only helper has a broken leg, is laying in bed, and is unable to do anything around the house. And you, in, old, in your old age, have to dry, try and keep up with things. And the old man said, well, it's very difficult to talk to you guys because all we see right now is a fragment in time. All we can say is that my son broke his leg. Well, about three weeks later, the country goes into a war. And guess what happens? They take all the young men to join the army to go into war. And all the people in the village, they go to the, young, to the old man and say, old man, you were right. We were wrong. See, your son breaking his leg was actually a blessing because he's the only young man who stayed in, at home. All our kids went to war, and they're probably going to die in the war. And the old man again said, well... All we can tell right now is that my son is at home and yours went to war. Only God knows the rest of the story because we only see a fragment in time. Events in our life happen as those fragments in time. Sometimes there's bad things that happen. It can be unemployment, losing a job. It can be maybe getting a bad score in an exam. I don't know. It can be something even bigger, losing a loved one. It can be something that affects the whole country, perhaps, going to war. There's bad things that happen. At the same time, there's good things that happen, like a single person getting married, or having kids, or even becoming a grandparent, 
sometimes, or getting a promotion at work, or finding a job after a long time of unemployment. And we can look at those single events and judge and say that's a blessing or that's a curse. Now, it's very easy for us to pass judgment on those events just by looking at a fraction in time. But we don't do that with everything in our lives. Like, you wouldn't buy a house just by looking at a picture or only looking at the door. You'd want to look at the whole house, get it inspected, getting proof that the house is solid. When you buy a car, you just don't look at one tire and then buy the whole car. For a lot of things, I mean, we don't pass judgment on only one thing. But many times we do that with God and looking at things and saying, this is a blessing or this is a curse. Saying, why, God, why are you doing this to me? Why am I going through this? Moving to the second point, we can only choose our response. So when life happens, we have two options. We can respond filled with faith or filled with fear, filled with anger, filled with resentment towards God. There's many characters in the Bible that we can talk about, but today I chose to talk about Joseph. The story of Joseph is very inspiring to me. It's not about the happy ending, but it's about the journey. So what do we see in Joseph? In Joseph, we see a lot of events that we can easily just isolate that event and say, well, this is a blessing or this is a curse. Now, Joseph was the first son of Jacob's favorite wife. We know that Jacob showed favoritism. He loved Rachel above all the other wives, and he loved Jacob above all the other sons. And you look at that, the favorite son, well, you can think it's a blessing. And then you continue reading the story, and then you read how all his brothers hated him. Well, that doesn't sound like a blessing anymore. Let's read the story. Let's turn to Genesis 37. Verses 1 through 4. Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob's family line. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending his flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his sons because he had been born to him in his old age, and he made an ornate, ornate uh, robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. So jo uh, Jacob made something very nice for him, made this colorful robe that set him apart from all the other sons. It seems like a blessing, but then you read that all his brothers hated him because of that. Well, it sounds like a curse. Later on, we read how his own brothers were facing a choice. It was kill him or sell him. And none of those choices seem like good choices, right? I mean, no one would be excited about having those two choices about their own life. And knowing that it's your own family that is debating those choices. But they choose to sell him. Now, is that a blessing or a curse? Well, it's a blessing that they didn't kill him. It seems like a curse that he lost his favorite son position to being a slave. Well, what happens later on? After that, he's put in charge uh, of the whole household of this palace guard. So everything is going well again. And then, well, because he's in the spotlight, well, the palace guard's wife likes him. Uh, and he is fleeing away from sin. You read that story and think like, wow, I mean, Joseph, he's amazing. Nobody else would have done that. But Joseph did that. So you expect a big blessing from God. What happens instead, you read that he's thrown in prison. Like, where's the reward there for doing the right thing? 
And again, we're judging by a fragment in time because we're thinking, well, he did the right thing. We expect a reward. And that is not always the case in our lives. Not always because we're a man of integrity, we get rewarded. But that's not the end of the story. The story continues. In there, he meets the pharaoh, Scott Bearer, and Baker. And by interpreting, he interprets their dream. And then you're thinking like, well, he did something great for them. He gave great news to the cupbearer. Surely he's going to remember Joseph and try and get him out of there once he's restored to his position. But what happens is once he's restored to his position, he kind of forgets about Joseph. Until two years later when Pharaoh has a dream and he needs someone to interpret the dream. Then two years later he thinks like, well, there was actually this Joseph guy that I met in prison and he interpreted my dream. He can probably do this. So let's read that story. It's uh, Genesis 41, 37 through 44. Joseph's suggestions were well received by Pharaoh and his officials. So Pharaoh asked his officials, Can we find anyone else like this man, so obviously filled with the Spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has revealed the meaning of the dreams to you, clearly no one else is as intelligent or wise as you. You will be in charge of my court, and all my people will take orders from you. Only I, sitting on the throne, will have a, a rank higher than yours. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the entire land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh removed his signet ring from his hand and placed it on Joseph's finger. He dressed him in fine linen clothing and hung a gold chain around his neck. Then he had Joseph ride in the chariot reserved for his second in command. And wherever Joseph went, the command was shouted, Kneel down. So Pharaoh put Joseph in charge of all Egypt. And Pharaoh said to him, I am Pharaoh, but no one will lift a hand or foot in the entire land of Egypt without your approval. You know, one of my first thoughts reading this passage was, why on earth would Pharaoh put him in charge? I mean, if we look at the history, people like Pharaoh, they had a lot of people who would interpret dreams, magicians and stuff like that they were not the ones ruling the country. I would think like, well, Joseph, you interpret the dream. You're great. Whenever I have another dream, I'll call on you. So you can interpret that. But you're in prison. I know nothing about you. I don't know how good you are at managing the whole country. Thank you for the information. Now my managers will take it from here. Instead, God did something that perhaps to a lot of us doesn't make sense. But he put Joseph in charge. Now we're looking at the life of, uh, of Joseph up to this point, and we can see the different events that brought him here. But the point of Joseph's story is not that every time is going to be a happy ending. It's more about the journey and the heart that Joseph had throughout this, and becomes clear when he faces his brothers. Now, there is two times that this is mentioned. First is in Genesis 45, the first time that Joseph reveals himself, and then 17 years later when his father passes away. So when he meets his brothers, they're afraid. They're thinking, this is Joseph that we sold into slavery. What is the first thought in their mind? He's going to seek revenge, because that's how we think. We did something bad. Now he has the power. He's going to get revenge. Because if it was me, that's what I would do. And Joseph tells them, it wasn't you. It was God. You intended for evil. God intended for good. They're thinking like, well, good is probably being nice to us because our father is still alive. So after their father passes away 17 years later, they reach out to Joseph again. And we're going to read that in uh, chapter 50, verses 15 through 21. But now that their father was dead, Joseph's brothers became fearful. Now Joseph will show his anger and pay us back for all the wrong we did to him, they said. So they sent this message to Joseph. Before your father died, he instructed us to say to you, please forgive your brothers for the great wrong they did to you, for their sin in entreating you so, cru entreating you so cruelly. So we, the servants of the God of your father, beg you to forgive our sin. When Joseph received the message, he broke down and wept. Then his brothers came and threw themselves down before Joseph. Look at your slaves, 
they said. But Joseph replied, don't be afraid of me. Am I God that I can punish you? You intend to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. No, don't be afraid. I will continue to take care of you and your children. So be reassured. he reassured them by speaking kindly to them. You know, a total, a total of 39 years have passed since the day that they sold Joseph into slavery. In their mind, they're still feeling the guilt. They still have the fear that even though he has been kind to them, after that point he's been kind to them for 17 years, they're thinking he was probably just waiting. And they're living in fear that he's going to harm them. And to me, it shows the contrast with Joseph's, Joseph's heart. He has moved on. He's not angry at them. He's not bitter. He's not holding anything against them. He says, I will continue to take care of you because in all of this, God was working. And he chooses to approach a situation with faith in God that God is working for something greater than his life. Many times, we like to think that we are the center of the universe and our life matters the most. The reality is that there's a greater picture of God and we are part of the greater picture. And it's about bringing glory to God and advancing the plans for the whole world, not just our own single life. And it's not just about a single event in our life when something bad happens or something good happens. It's a much bigger picture. And we want to respond with faith that God is making something bigger happening. We don't want to make it personal. We don't want to make it about the people who let us down, who hurt us and hold a grudge against them and look for an opportunity to pay them back. We want to focus on what God is doing and be able to live our life with faith. There's many people in the Bible that when we look at them have been transformed because they approach the situation with faith. They did not let a failure, sometimes a very big failure, define them. I'm thinking about Abraham. I mean, when I first read about Abraham, the guy was a coward. He let his wife go with another man because he was afraid for his own life. I could not think any less of a man doing that. And then I see that later in life, God works with him, and because of his faith, he is called the father of faith. We are called children of Abraham when we have faith. God transformed the situation. He took him from being a coward to a father of faith. We look at Joseph, uh, Joseph's father, Jacob. A deceiver, a cheater, deceived his own brother, and God transformed him into the father of Israel. He's called Israel. We look at Moses. Murdered someone, ran away, tried to run away from responsibility, coming up with all kinds of excuses so he wouldn't have to go back to Egypt. And God put him in charge of leading the nation of Israel. And he was called a friend of God. We look at David, committed adultery, killed one of his best friends in order to cover it up. And God transforms him, and he's called a man after God's own heart. Peter, he was a hothead. At the time that Jesus needed him the most, he ran away. He was a coward. Wasn't even able to face a servant girl. And then God used him to lead the church. He was the person who opened the doors of the kingdom to Israel and the Gentiles. We look at Paul. God used him with so much impact someone who was persecuting people, who was thirsty for blood, to, uh, to someone who taught so much about grace and love. 
And that's when we choose to not define ourselves by a failure in our life, but look at a bigger picture. Let God work in our lives and continue walking with faith so that God can do so much greater things than what we see. Greater things than we can ask for or imagine. I was sharing yesterday that many times we fail to make a decision or take a step of faith because of this picture that we have of God. You know, when we have seen the movie just by a fragment, we we're able to know what it is. And sometimes, when we have the wrong picture of God, we can judge God by a single event. I know that when I was studying the Bible, I had this picture of God that he was going to be controlling my life, limiting my choices. He was going to dictate what was right and wrong. And I was concentrating, I was focusing on all the things that I was going to miss out. Because I didn't know anything about God's love. I didn't know how he would work for my good, for my salvation. And because of that, I was hesitant. My picture of God was wrong. So every event that happened, I was interpreting it wrong. There's a passage that I'd like to end that I love going to. It's Romans 8.28. And you can start there and read to the end of the chapter. It says, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. When we love God and we have been called according to his purpose, everything that happens in our lives is for the good of us. And he continues saying that God loved us so much that he gave his one and only son for us. And that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Let's remember that. Let that be the picture of God in our lives. And let's respond with faith. When we have those situations, whether it's an hour of being stuck in traffic, whether it's a bad week, a bad month, or a bad season, let's choose to respond with faith so that God can keep working, transforming us, and bring about better change in the world. Amen? Amen. Thank you. Well, before we close out with one last song, I've, um, I know Hillary had mentioned uh, wanting to share. Um, I'm going to let her come up and speak real quick. Uh, just a few announcements. Was there anybody else who had an announcement? I'm not usually in charge of the announcements, so um, this is my way of making sure they get done. <laughs> Are there? If there's any other announcements, if you guys want to go ahead and come up now and do that, or just... For the, the, okay, so for Bible talk leaders, and, or just if you want to do it there, that's fine. So if you, if you do have Bible talk on, on Wednesdays and you meet, um, if you could maybe give consideration to that so that if somebody in your group wants to go ahead and do that, they can dock, duck out a little early uh, or maybe end your group a little early so people can go. Either way, I know that's what we're going to kind of do so people have a chance to go to that. But it will be here at the building, 730, um, Wednesday night for part two, uh, uh, helping people with mental illness, mental illness and how do we help um, in those situations. So.
Heather? Cool. Um, I just was going to mention, I know there aren't a lot of us this morning, but I do have invitations for the Trunk or Treat event that um, is coming up on the 29th. It's at 1.30 here at the building. Um, we have a sign-up sheet out there. I'm going to sit out there after the last song. Um, so if you guys want to sign up so that you can either do a trunk or help out with activities, I know we've got a few of the campus girls have agreed to help with face paint, and we're going to have um, a station that the kids can paint pumpkins and that kind of thing. But if you guys could grab some invitations and or sign up, that'd be great. We really want to get a lot of people involved in the community this year for it. So thanks. Amen. All right, and just one last thing. As we uh, stand together, uh, I'm going to invite those who have kids downstairs to go ahead and uh, whoever checked them in can go check them out and get them during this last song so that those teachers can get uh, some relief and be able to clean up so they can get out of here on time. Amen? All right, one last song. What a fellowship. What a joy divine Leaning on the everlasting arms What a blessedness What a peace of mind Leaning on the everlasting arms David leaning Leaning Safe and secure from all alarms Leaning 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 on the everlasting arms Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way, leaning on the everlasting arm. Oh, how bright the path goes from day to day, leaning on the everlasting arm. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms. I have blessed peace with my Lord. So leaning on the everlasting arms. You know we're leaning on Jesus. Leaning on Jesus. Safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning on Jesus. Leaning on Jesus. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Amen. You are dismissed.